Instructional Designers and in Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino, makers of Domino One, the cloud-based authoring tool for e-learning. Learn how your team can work together better at domino.com. Now, here's this week's episode. Oh, I thought the jingle. There we go. <laughs> Woo! Must be Wednesday. Guess what, folks? It's idiotic time. Who's got the group now? Yeah, there we go. That's what we like to see. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. It is Wednesday, it is a idiotic day, and hopefully everybody's hearing everything and seeing everything and everything is working because we scared away the gremlins of technology. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hello, gang. Good morning. Chris, how's the weather in Ottawa? It is uh, an overcast and gently raining day. Exactly what the gardeners would like today. Fantastic. We got the UK showing up. We've got yeah. India in the house too and Tucson. Woo! Everybody get all excited about that. <laughs> and Duck, North Carolina. I have not heard of Duck, North Carolina before. Wow. But I feel I feel like you'd have a reaction every time you drove into the city. You'd see the sign and you'd go. <laughs> Yeah. Where's my drum roll? Dang it. That's a visual dad joke. I don't think I've done one of those yet. Oh, five years of that. eh? Oh so I need God. even a more special sound effect for that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Hello. Oh, sorry. Hey, I guess I should stop that. Oh, dance again. Dance over. <laughs> That's a do over. <laughs> uh, oh, Jamie's mentioning duck is known for donuts. Okay. Duck donuts. Uh... Hmm. It sounds all right. Little, sounds a little quackers to me, but whatever. Oh, yeah. Hey, who's our guest this morning, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> Folks, we have an actual purpose to be here today, not just dumb jokes. Although that's part of the fun, isn't it? Anyway, yes, we gang, we have Cammy Bean joining us here. And Cammy, um, this is your first time with us here. I can't believe that. But yes. uh, so for some of our folks who might not know uh, you or might not have uh, encountered you at conferences, those kinds of things, tell our friends in the chat here a little bit about yourself. Sure thing. Um, first of all, hi. I have coffee, but no donuts today. Uh, very excited to be here. Um, an e-learning person, I guess we would say. So I've been in this business for 27 years now. 1996, I got my first job as an instructional designer at a small multimedia company here in Massachusetts. And there's kind of been no turning back ever since. Uh, today, I work for an organization called Kineo. I've been with Kineo for, with Kineo for 14 years. Unbelievable. Wow. Um, yeah, and we, we design and develop custom learning solutions for organizations kind of across the full full gamut. Um, I am an accidental instructional designer. In fact, I wrote the book on it. Uh, this is the first edition. If we want to go back and make some duck jokes, this is the first edition with the ducks on it. <laughs> and I did, in fact, have pet ducks at the time. I remember your ducks. Yeah, we had pet ducks. Um, and there's a picture of me in the book with, in the first edition, with my pet duck, Snappy. Nice. Anyways, the second edition has moved on from ducks. And we are, uh, yes, we have origami birds now. 27 years, I know, crazy. And somebody, did someone say they were 27 years old? No. Because <laughs> <laughs> that, that could be. Um, yeah, yeah. So, I think some folks in our chat haven't even person. been born. Yeah, there we're, are. They weren't yes. even born then. Yeah, they were. Yes, I have people on my team who weren't born when I started in the field. So that feels old, Brent. How yes, did that I happen know. to us? I'm um, not kidding. I um, <laughs> I've been in the space for 23 years now, and in my earliest years, yours was one of um, about four or five key blogs that I read every week, checked in on, etc. 
Um, that that era of our space was all blogga blogatastic. I felt um, we've lost something. Not going to lie with the demise of RSS and Google Reader, uh, etc. But the um, you know the the blogosphere in our space was so important for so many of us. Um, like yourself, accidental uh, instructional designer did not come into this space with formal training. I was in journalism before this came on board, editing some content for someone, and then he said, "Oh, why don't you write this course?" And I went, "Okay, why don't I write this course?" I okay. can write. Yeah, I went to I school. Write. I can train. I can do yeah, that. I can yeah. do this, and yeah. and I did it, you know, and kept going. But, yeah. um, but that whole pathway of, of so many of us in this space coming in from the side, you know, maybe they were maybe you were an expert in something, and they asked you to do the next training session because you already knew that software tool because you were part of the dev team or the product manager or something, or, or you were in HR and you got started doing some sessions and found you. Um, yeah, it. we kind of a lot of us get magically tapped because we demonstrate some inherent skill or capability to connect people, to do jazz hands in front of a classroom, <laughs> to write a good newsletter, to do a good job aid, to yeah, use your journalism skills and build a course. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a very true story. And back to 2005 when I started blogging. Uh, that was a very intentional moment in my career. I had been in the e-learning business for about 10 years. And I was like, holy crap, this is probably what I'm doing for the rest of my life. Um, and I should do it with some purpose and passion. And Brent was one of the first people that I connected with. So um, like Brent was part of that blogging community. Brent, that was, is that yeah. 20 years ago, almost 18 years ago? That's what we're saying. Wow. Yeah. So it was, I mean, it that... was 2005, August, I think August, 2005 was my very first post after multiple blogging attempts in other platforms and other things the one, the blog that finally stuck was elearndev.blogspot.com. That's I right. Haven't... I remember it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have learning visions. Um, I still have it. It's still up, although I haven't posted in it very much in the last few years. Uh, yeah. I've, I've kept it alive. Uh, yeah, it was awesome. We were all connecting and talking yeah. out loud and it figuring out what we were doing and sharing yeah. our stuff in a very open way. Um, I think for, I don't know, those of us who cut our teeth back in 2005 and in, in those world, it was really heady and exciting. We, yeah. you know, I got connected to some amazing people in those days that I still consider my friends, my colleagues, my contacts. Uh, it led to my job at Kineo, like no doubt about it. It, you know, it helped me make a name for myself. I didn't know it at the time that that's what I was doing, but. You know. <laughs> I know, I know none of us yeah. did. Yeah. yeah, I was just having a good time, you know, just like, oh, this is a cool way to share my thoughts with myself and to have a nice record of it. And then I met Mark Ehlert for the first time and he, yeah. and, and uh, he calls me up and he's like, uh, yeah, I work for Elliot Maisie and he'd like to have you come speak at his conference. And I'm like, I'm sorry. Do you have the right person? <laughs> and I'm like, he's like, well, you're the guy that writes the blog, right? And like, yeah, I, yeah, I do that. I'm like, but nobody reads it. Nobody. It's uh -huh. just I have like two or three people that comment. He's like, yeah, there's this thing called Google Analytics. You should look into it, Brent. <laughs> so, yeah, like you, everything just went from there. Yep. Yeah, we were always checking our stats. I got I so, know, many, right? so many. <laughs> Yeah, my favorite thing was the very first international person that commented that was when i it blew my mind i was like oh my gosh it's like when i was a little tiny kid you got a pen pal right and you yeah. have to write the letter and you'd send it off to africa and you'd get this letter with a, a really cool stamp on it from another country and it was so cool but it took forever and now all of a sudden i'm getting messages from people in other countries and that that was like that was a super cool moment that was a super cool moment and then in um i don't know 2007 we all went on facebook at the same time together because yeah. facebook had just opened up so we were the early grown-up adopters of facebook it was all these e-learning nerds and it was super weird because like two years later then everyone else came on facebook and now it was all about high school reunion and posting your high school photos but we had all been on there for a couple of years and then the same group of people went over to Twitter together and we were all like on Twitter trying to figure out how to use it for learning. It's funny. Um, yeah. Yeah. You and now the good it's like old school and we're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> we're all curmudgeon. Yeah. <laughs>
what's been the what's been the reaction to the book? That's what I'd like to know. Like, uh, I mean, I know there are a lot of accidental instructional designers out there, but are there any interesting stories of people reaching out to you? Um, I'm just blown away. Well, a I was the the first book was successful, and the second book, mm -hmm. like re relaunching the second one, has been even more impactful. It feels like, and a lot of people just sharing their accidental ID stories. I mean, everybody has a kumbaya moment and I've been, you know, doing workshops around the accidental instructional designer for longer than I've had this book. And it's uh, really great getting all these people together who realize that they are not alone, that they are not the only one who don't know what they're doing and are trying to figure it out as they go along. And so a lot of people will say, wow, Cami, your book was the book that I used when I first started getting into the field. Thank you so much. I'm buying the second edition. Uh, that's been super gratifying colleges use it as as you know required reading in their classes that kind of blew me away mm -hmm. uh i think there's you know there's what the academics do and then there's what we actually do in the real world and helping them understand that uh you know there's reality and there's yeah. you know there's what we learn in school um and we all know from that right like you know yeah yeah. Kevin in the chat earlier posted up that uh, when he fell into this field like so many of us that uh, accidental accidental instructional designer was his uh, was his bible or his guidebook for a long time so that's cool to hear right, right here in the chat yeah, yeah thanks kevin that's great um yeah. yeah and i think the uh i don't know for me i've sort of expanded it it's really it's it's not just about accidental instructional designers it's really anyone in l d like none of us thought we were going to be in learning and development at yeah. a corporate you know when you know what <clears throat> you know um or even that uh, yeah. that it existed Things yeah. have changed a lot in 20 years, though. You know, there are people who come out of school and know that that's what they want to do now. Uh, there mm -hmm. are programs that you can go to online and get certified. I mean, in 2005, Brent, when we were <laughs> first blogging, there was not an online instructional design certificate program that you could take and go get the jump start. Uh oh. No. No. Um, no. Oh, sorry, no. My, everything just went black on my screen. Can you guys still see me? Oh, we yeah, still yeah, have yeah. it. Yep, you're okay. still here. I yeah, don't yeah. see you, so that's super weird. <laughs> no. um, I'll keep Flying talking. Now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> as long auto, as you can auto, hear auto, us, auto, uh, yeah. it's, it's all yeah, good. Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, okay. Hmm. All right. Um, yeah, you, career day in high school, there was no table for instructional designer or, or, or L and D or even trainer for sure. So, yeah. although I'm seeing Cammy's frozen now, so maybe something. Oh, here wrong. I come. There oh, I am. here we go. There All we right. go. All righty. My, my monitor went to sleep. My my laptop went to sleep because it because I haven't been doing anything. Ah. As far as it knows. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was flying blind, Kevin. That's how good I am. <laughs> blind, blind. And I love all that the mouse every now and jokes. then. I'm going to have to go back and read the chat because it looks like some very witty people are making some very funny bird jokes. Thank you. All right. I was I was noticing that too. We we've missed a lot of them, so yeah. Well, I'll, we'll have to we'll tweet them out later. <laughs> so what's um uh what's different in the new version? What what did you have to update? Yeah, obviously, everything things a lot has changed over the yeah, years. Yeah, I mean certainly. Well, a lot has changed, and nothing has uh -huh. changed. Okay, yes. Right? I mean. <laughs> Right, nothing's changed, yeah. Brent. Since I 20 know. years ago, nothing's I changed. <laughs> and yet so much has changed. Uh, so yeah. obviously I had to update technology and things were a little bit out, outdated. Um, yeah. The other thing is I have spent 10 more years in the industry since the, yeah. the first book, the first edition came out in 2014. Um, in the preceding 10 years, I went from an accidental instructional designer to become an accidental salesperson. Um, mm -hmm. So today I actually, I, I lead up the U.S. sales team for Kineo um, and I am working with clients much earlier in the process really to architect solutions and, you know, I sort of jokingly say, you know, people say, oh, you came to the dark side, right? Um, but it's, if you've ever worked in instructional design at a small vendor, which I've always been on the vendor side, you were the person, I was the person that got trotted out to close every deal. You know, because I could speak with credibility about instructional design. I could speak about learning experiences, how to design for the learner, et cetera, et cetera. So I was always part of the the sales process, almost from day one of working. Like I'd help work on proposals and things like that. So, anyways, about seven years ago, I moved into a sales role, which was a huge shift. So what that has meant, though, is my perspective has totally broadened. Part of selling for me the first yeah. probably four 
well, actually five years, I was also selling our LMS. So I was selling content development services that Kinea provides to our customers and our learning management system. And if you know me, you know that for years, I kind of ignored the technology bit and like la la la, I'd stick my fingers in my ears. And you know, I had to learn the LMS and understand it and speak that language. And when you're talking to LMS buyers, it's very different than talking to custom content buyers. Yeah, It's a totally different you know, product line, service, et cetera, et cetera. So my scope and my vision has just expanded. So that gets reflected in the book too. Um, just my wider perspective. The other thing we've seen a lot of people coming into the field, and I think I saw some um, mention of it here, is a lot of teachers getting into instructional design, working in corporate training. And certainly over the pandemic, we saw a lot of teachers making that move. And there was just I think there continues to be a lot of discussion on LinkedIn about all of that. So I was aware that there was this whole new audience coming into it who really needed more foundational grounding into what is corporate L&D. So yeah. I've added sections about, you know, where does instructional design happen? What kinds of organizations? What kinds of departments? I have sections on the tools, you know, just trying to provide kind of that basic like, hey, what's an LXP versus an LMS? You know, just really foundational yeah. grounding stuff. Uh, there's a new chapter on assessment and evaluation and things got moved around. A lot of it's the same. So some people have said, if I have the first edition, should I get the second edition? Of course you should get the second edition. <laughs> Just get both. It's a bundle deal. Of course. <laughs> on the one hand, on the other hand, if you, I don't know, you know, it, it's not a requirement for you. If you've been doing <laughs> this that long and you already read the first part, first edition, you probably moved on since then. So yeah, I won't force you to buy it, but. I would love it if you did. <laughs> yeah, I think the thing I appreciate is the um, uh, any of the books in our industry that that bring to light the reality of the work we do. There's so many books out there on I don't know what you might call like the the Puritan approach to instructional design and the, the idealistic view, perhaps. The, yes, right of of just ID and and because uh, the. The idealistic view of ID, ID is ID, and it and it and it applies the same way everywhere. That's a beautiful world to live in. But <laughs> there's when you get into corporate America, there's so many other pressures and influences and reasons for doing the work that you're doing. And the timelines are so incredibly different yeah. than the pressures and the politics and the sales. Because whether you'd like it to believe it or not, if you're in ID, you're also in sales. Uh, you know, you're selling your ability, you're selling the training product, you're trying to get people to take your courses. Yep. If you don't, you know, I mean, there's just there's there's always there's a marketing aspect to it. We've had folks on the show talking about marketing in L and D and whatnot. Yep. I mean, it's just there's so so much involved in it that people for the longest time, right back in the day, it, nobody talked about, right? Nobody talked about, everybody was talking about uh, just pure instructional design as a practice, which is great. I mean, don't get me wrong, but. Um, well, and if you if you think about it, like, yeah, pure instructional design is like this, right? <laughs> yeah, there you go, yep. <laughs> um, which was one of the books I think I bought used back in 2005 when we were all getting our formal degree, informal degrees in instructional design, right? Um, yeah. Reading those books, like that's pure instructional design, but the reality in our field is that if you are practicing as an instructional designer in corporate America, you're doing instructional design, but there are so many other things that you're doing, just to your point. And I talk I talk in the book, and you, if you've heard me speak, you've heard me talk about PI, um, the four segments that we really have to understand. So there's learning, there's the learning bit of the pie, learning science, instructional design, instructional assessment strategy, et cetera, et cetera. Then there's a creative component of what we do. So if you're doing anything with e-learning, digital learning, which, hello, anything in L&D these days involves some aspect of digital learning, it's, you know, or and even if it's just classroom, it's storytelling, it's graphics, it's audio production, it's game design, it's all these creative things that fall into yeah. it. Then there's the technology piece that we have to understand, and you may not have to master it. You could stick your fingers in your ears like I have for years, but you need to be well-versed enough to know what an LMS is, SCORM, XAPI, QA, 
I mean, increasingly all this AI stuff. I mean, the technology piece is huge. And then there's the business piece of the pie, which as you said, it's sales, it's project management, it's consulting, it's marketing. I mean, it's it's so many. So the reality of instructional design is not pure. It's it's a lot of hats, as we, we say, right? Yeah, it's a tiny, it's a tiny little piece of a very big career yes. pie. <laughs> and one job title will say like, we're hiring an instructional designer. And it's looking for all of these things. And you're like, whoa, 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 wait, wait. <laughs> and then and there often will be on the last thing of the job description, it will say, and other responsibilities as identified. You know, like you could do anything in this field. Yeah. Um, so how do you define it? How does your boss define instructional design? How do your colleagues, how do, you know, how does yeah. the business, it could be totally different. And one organization's view of an instructional designer is gonna be very different than another. Um, and whether or not there should be an industry standard, you know, yada, yada, yada. You know, we can have that argument. We've been having that same argument for <laughs> as well. So people who think they've been, should you get a degree? Do you need a, you know, or do you not need a degree to practice? We've been having those arguments yeah, for years. Yeah, for sure. Um, there's been a few mentions from folks in the chat of having come from teaching. Uh, so clearly that's a, a, a pattern that, uh, that we've observed mm -hmm. for sure. Um, and then all those things that you were just mentioning, Heather says in the chat, hats, that's what we call them. And we have a lot of them. It's exactly it. Um, what, back in, um, before you know, my prior career in journalism, we had a cork board up on the wall and there was a cartoon there. And it said, uh, the typical day for a journalist. And there was someone standing back and there was a wall with cards on it and he was throwing a dart. And it said, at the top of the, the wall said, today I'm an expert in, <clears throat> and it's, oh, <laughs> finances or, or politics, you know, this whole range. Of, and, and that's um, very much what we do so often here too. Oh, you want me to help you train people in X, Y, Z. Hmm, never done that before, but I guess we're going to learn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, doing that is, I mean, that was always the funnest part, right? Every project yeah. is different. If you're an inherently curious person, which I think most of us who fall into it, like there's probably mm -hmm. some basic character traits that we all fall into that get into this field. I think curiosity is one of them and that ability to get back into beginner mindset. I mean, I hope hopefully, um, right, like yep. beginner mindset every time, like I could do training on any subject so long as you give me a good subject matter expert <laughs> that I can act super dumb with. Right. Like it's really fun. You ask all the dumb questions. Yeah. You're you're being that novice learner. Um, yeah, yep. And uh, yeah, so from a from a career standpoint, though, you could take it anywhere because instructional design happens everywhere. You know, I sort of if you want to go save pandas at World Wildlife Fund, they have instructional designers. If you want to, you know, work in corporate finance, they need instructional designers. If you want to be manufacturing, retail, etc., training is everywhere there is a place for all of us and you can find what you're super passionate about. And I would also encourage you if you're at a job where you're wearing hats that you don't like, go find another job or, or change your job so that you're wearing just the hats that you do like. You don't have to do all of those things that don't really float your boat. Um, there's plenty of things to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. My first uh, set of projects, I was just thinking um, uh, a huge project for um, oil, upgrading as part of the refinery process mm, yeah never done that before <laughs> uh cleaning in the um in a, in a hospital setting uh uh and then i got to do a project after that which was a branching scenario in finance so it's just like woo where are we going today yeah 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 but what matters is you know the outcome the results you're trying to get for that learner and you can set that up because you are a digital learning expert chris <laughs> it doesn't matter what the content is. I mean, that's, that's what right. we tell our clients. You are the yeah. subject matter experts. You bring that knowledge to the table. We will bring the digital learning expertise to the table. Together, we can do anything. Mm -hmm. okay. It's uh, but it, it's the uh, it's the Justice League of corporate training. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, Daniel do, is thrown into the chat. I'm considering pr pursuing a master's in instructional design. Uh, what mm -hmm. are your thoughts on that? up to you i mean i yeah we, we should get daniel on camera we can have a little intervention no um i think daniel is just really understanding why what's motivating you a lot of people um, i think the learning guild does some research on this recently because we are seeing an in an uptick in in the percentage of people who are going back and getting a degree from from when i wrote the book 
10 years ago, that number has changed. There's more people who are going back and getting degrees at this point. And I think it's just because they're available. They weren't as you know widely available 15 years ago. You couldn't just go on, get a, an online master's degree in instructional design. If you feel like it is knowledge that you wanna get, go for it. Is it gonna give you a better salary? Maybe not. Um, I think there's like minimal data that it's actually going to increase your salary. So you might end up paying more for your degree than you get back from it. It might be a small uptick. I I, I check out the Learning Guild um, report on that, which we can go look for later and share later. Yeah, if your um, company is sporting for it, then it's, you know, why turn that down, right? Yeah, but, uh, yeah. But, but to your point, the ROI, yeah, probably not so much. Uh, if you've been, doing, wealthy. you've only been doing this for a couple of years, though, and you want uh, more yeah. members of your feather, it's not going to sure. hurt you. Um, right, right, all for sure. A lot of people, the validation, you know, I don't know. I wouldn't, at this point in my career, I'm not going to go back in a master's degree in instructional design. I don't have one. I don't need one at this point, I don't think. Maybe i go get a master's in something else, um, more focused, but not yeah. instructional for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I went through a phase where I was telling people, if you're going to go back, get an MBA, keep your instructional design degree. But if you go get an MBA, now you understand business, or at least you're going to be exposed to business and it's marketable and you'll be the only person in the room that is an instructional designer with an MBA that understands the business. And now you understand accounting, you understand spreadsheets, you understand why your manager said no when you asked for that new piece of tech, or when you said, hey, let's do VR instead of a job aid. And they said, mm, no, let's just do the job aid. Uh, it may be like, now you can kind of understand where things are coming from and whatnot. So yeah, I, mean, yeah. I, don't, I don't necessarily go down that road Elizabeth. anymore. But Elizabeth shares a good point, like for her in, in DOD in Virginia, the master's project might be valued. So it depends on the sector mm. you're working. Oh, government for sure. Government. makes a yeah. big difference. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then Heather, your point about higher levels need more business acumen and strategy that kind of lines into what Brent was just saying. Um, so you kind of need yeah. that bigger picture of the organization, All right? My, my screen might freeze again. Sorry. I keep letting it go to sleep. <laughs> John also pointed out uh, in um, in the chat too that uh, make sure everything else in your life can support it. Um, the number of weekends that my family sacrificed because I was at the computer <laughs> doing course things. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, we all well, got that, through it's it. It's true. In two thousand five, when I was considering, I was like, okay, this is my career for the rest of my life. I've been doing this for ten years, and oh wow, I could get a degree in it or something. I had two babies, you know, and one more was about to come, come along too. Like I was not going back to get a degree at that point. And that's why I bought, you know, that green book, you know, and I just started doing all my own informal study. You can go off and read, you know, Dick and Carrie and yeah. um, Mayer and Ruth Clark and Michael Allen and Julie Dirksen and Kathy Moore, read all the books. Um, you can do <laughs> that on your own time and you don't right. necessarily need a degree for that. Um, and Daniel, thank you. I also think they should give me an honorary master's degree. Somebody should, right? Come on. <laughs> I, um, I, dub, I, dub the, I dub the Masters of Instructional Design Master from Kennedy. Idiotic. Yes, I will take it. Um, <laughs> um, and if I had him, a sword handy, but you know I don't. So. <laughs> I don't know that it would reach from Ottawa to yeah. Massachusetts. Um, and yes, an exceptional por portfolio can eclipse a master's degree. I saw a great comment on something. It was about it was talking about portfolios and job interviews, just to t take us off and the the like putting a spin on when you're going in for a job interview is ask the company to show you what good looks like to them that they've done internally. I thought that was brilliant, right? Because yeah. they they want you to show them their stuff, but let's see where you guys are starting from, people. Um, right, right. Yeah, because uh, oftentimes it it's uh, it's not. Uh... Not something they're proud of, Correct. <laughs> which right. might be why they're trying to hire somebody. <laughs> yeah, it could be. Or they could be like many organizations. They've just started from scratch. They've decided by accident that they needed a training team. And now they're anointing people internally and everyone's figuring out as they go along. And we have a whole new batch of accidental instructional designers that are figuring it out yeah. for the first time. Yeah, I think the I, I think what folks need to recognize and I um I think the awakening for me was when we were building in school, right? Or um, 
I did end. I did get the master's degree, but that was I was an accidental master's degree attender, but that's a whole nother story. But you know, we spend six months working on a project, right? And you go through you very painstakingly, they take you through the whole entire instructional design process. And then the reality of getting my first job where I'm thinking I'm all that in a bag of chips and I have a master's degree and I know instructional design and everything. And then your manager comes in and says, um, we need to get some training done. Yeah, you get that buzz of excitement, new project, new topic. And he hands you a workbook and says, that new software we bought for you, can you take this workbook and turn it into an e-learning? Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely, I can do that. How long do you think that's going to take? Uh, at least four four months or so you know we got to go through this process that process and i rambled on for a while and he was so nice he was he was a great manager yeah he, uh, he just sat back in his chair and he's like that's that's excellent brent what can you get me by the end of the week uh-huh <laughs> there's there's the idealist version and there's reality <laughs> uh, yeah and that's when it hit me in the face and i was like Oh, uh, and I was kind of mad. I was pretty indignant about the whole thing too. Sure, I was, like, I was like, well, uh, you know, here, here's what we can do. I, I can, I can scan each page in the workbook and then, and then make it a slide. And then I can maybe, if I've got enough time, to add a little quiz at the end. He's like, that sounds awesome. Do that. <laughs> and I remember just all of a sudden being deflated because I thought I was coming up with the dumbest solution ever and he was like oh that's acceptable so all of a sudden i'm thinking to myself i've got a master's degree for this <laughs> i know it's brutal it <laughs> but anyways sorry um <laughs> i'm i'm sure you have a plethora of similar stories as well not so much you know because i've always been on the vendor side um I was internal to a company where I got involved in training and then that led me to go, huh, I kind of like this training stuff. And, and then I got a job at a multimedia production company. That's what we called yeah. it back then, e-learning. Yeah. Jay Cross hadn't come up with the term yet for e-learning. So 1996. CBT. Um, it was, yeah, CBT, <laughs> WBT. Uh, no, it wasn't WBT yet. It was CBT. It was CD-ROMs. Um, yep. And our early projects were taking uh big laser disc courses and converting them to cd-rom and companies didn't have lms's yet they would ship i remember we did training for this bank um and everything was uh printed on cd-roms the courses it was really fun to design the label that was going to go on the cd-rom you know, our graphics team would oh, design yeah. the labels you finally get to um, use the cool graphic tools we were we were fedexing scripts all over the country you know and a production script would be this thick uh and the companies would, they, they get the training on their laptops and then they would ship the laptops around the country and people would send the laptops back to them and then they would get the data. It was, it was pre LMS guys. Um, yeah. I'm a long way since my day. <laughs> <laughs> you kids get off my CD-ROM. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You think you're so fancy with your authoring tools and your, <laughs> LXPs and your XAPIs. We didn't have that back in our day. Yeah. I remember when we had to hand code drag and drop interactions from <laughs> scratch. That's what we did. We had our own proprietary software and video codecs and you know, mm -hmm. man, it was different different times. Very and, different. And the cost of e-learning back in, you know, a, an hour of e-learning content or CD-ROM content was probably forty thousand dollars in 1990 dollars which i think is sixty five thousand dollars per hour by today's standards do you know who pays for that to a vendor these days nobody nobody i mean unless you're doing like something really high end yeah you know super high end a lot of video a lot of you know highly gamified um super custom experience no i mean what's happened is that the authoring tools have you know all of them have have pushed Mm -hmm. push those costs down, which is great. Um, we've talked about the democratization of <laughs> e-learning, right? Anyone can create it now because these tools have made it so easy uh, for better or for worse, right? Garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. yeah. So that's actually a perfect spot for me to throw in um, how much I've appreciated the fact that you've coined the phrase clicky, clicky, bling, bling. 
<laughs> it's the proudest moment of my life. <laughs> um, it, it's become part of my repertoire, and I almost always make sure that I credit you because it, it's uh, because people go, "Oh my God, I love that!" No, it's not me. It's, it's Cami Bean. She came Aww, up with it. I, I, I've, I've adopted thank this. You, we pass you. it on. But um, it, yeah, I read that back on the blog at some point, sure, and 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 went, yeah, I, I, I'm in on that for sure. Yep, because we do do so many things that are. I don't know, interactive or fancy, uh, yes. but without the actual learning process in mind or what learning value are we actually bringing in? Yeah, so clicky, um, clicky, bling, bling for those who haven't read the book. Um, it's all the whiz, it's all the bang, it's the jazz hands of e-learning, it's animated flying buttons, it's putting 50 things to click on on a screen because you can, it's you know making it super interactive, it's having a drag and drop because your stakeholders want it to be interactive, but there's really no points for that. It's interaction and flash not not action script flash and and yes we, we <laughs> used macromedia back in the day um kim um it's it's all of that flashy stuff that ultimately depresses learning outcomes because it distracts us and if you've read any um ruth clark uh yeah. you know will tallheimer they talk about these um seductive details and how these seductive details actually depress learning because what you remember at the end of the day is the flashing <laughs> clicky clicky bling bling and not the substance and the you know what what you actually need to remember exactly yep 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 yeah. uh yeah. It's, a, it's a key lesson for someone new even new now you come in and you see oh i can do all of these funky things and my boss wants them yeah. Um, so how do you, you know, how, trying to have that, uh, that first of all, coming to the realization that what you're doing isn't actually um, helping the learning process, isn't translating to performance improvement. Um, and then being able to tell your boss who, you know, signs your check or who does your, <laughs> your quarterly reviews or whatever that they're wrong is also another hmm, thing that yep. we all have to learn. So how do you push back on that? Um, you know, as Heather points out, flashy and shiny still sell to a lot of people. Um, it's not that it shouldn't be shiny. I mean, it, it still needs to look beautiful. You know, we know that people make a split decision as to whether mm -hmm. something is credible. And a lot of that's based on the looks. Yeah. Um, if it's, you know, we, we had a PhD student who was doing uh, her PhD while she was working as an instructional designer for us. And the project was looking at, you know, some website that was same content, you know, poorly designed website, and a beautiful website and people rated the beautifully designed website as more credible. It's the exact same content, right? We know that people yeah. are gonna pay more attention if it looks good. Um, so looks matter, a visual design matters, branding matters, layout matters, that stuff totally matters. But it's the valueless interactivity and you know, a way you can push back on that is where does the most substantive interactivity happens? Well, it happens in our brains <laughs> and we can interact without even clicking on anything. You can ask reflective questions. You can get people thinking about how they're gonna apply this back on the job. We don't have to make it clicky, clicky, flashy, flashy to make it interactive and meaningful. And certainly a multiple choice question when written really well, it's scenario based and you're really getting someone to think about the outcomes and the consequences, et cetera, like that can be a really great form of interaction and you're just clicking on one thing, right? So don't, right. don't overdo it and, um, you know, selling it that way, you know, look at the data, look at the research. Um, there's, you know, lots of books on design that you can find all of that, you know, in that talks about the looks matter, but distracting interaction will depress your outcomes for sure. Yeah, I think, I think good design, if you talk to any designer in any field that designs anything, really, really good design is getting, getting the point across with the least amount of stuff it's like it's more about taking away than it yeah. is about adding more stuff and so you know and and you know yes aesthetic and design is important but inherently you're you're going to lose all of the clicky clicky bling bling by just doing good design because good mm -hmm. design doesn't have all of that extra stuff yeah Yep. And uh, Kathy Moore's action mapping, you know, approach will really help you focus on. So someone's asking what's um, five top, top five must knows. I'd say go, go, go read Kathy Moore's action mapping or map it um, because that lays out like, you know, really thinking about what is it you want people to be able to do. Then you design activities that help 
practice that thing that you want them to be able to do. And so it's focused, yeah. it's interactivity that really is going to yeah. impact the outcome that you're after. Uh, yeah, like that's kind of where we need to start. Yeah, if the job is a panel uh, uh, in reality, right? Your job is a lot of clicking and a lot of blinging, then yeah, yeah, that's going to be in your training because that's the reality of the person's mm -hmm. job. But I can't even like think of one off the top of my head other than maybe like a a pilot looking at a lot of dashboard stuff and light flashing lights and and little bells going off when you're crashing or something. I don't know. Yeah, there, there you want to make sure they're clicking on the right clicky clicky. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the other day I was uh, I was in surgery and they handed me a new tool and the entire interface was built like a Jeopardy game. So I'm so glad I took that e-learning course. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was the down, down, down part of my career was a client who insisted we make them a Jeopardy board, and um, it was a low point for sure. Mm -hmm. And we tried, we did the consulting, but no, they really wanted a Jeopardy board. And um, you know, unless you're training to be Alex Trebek <laughs> or a contestant, uh, yeah. you know, money wants what money wants. Yeah, and then the question is, are we willing to provide it, or do we want to? uh keep our impressive uh <laughs> i don't do that kind of work <laughs> design integrity i mean there's some yes, place integrity where, that's what i was looking for. you know drill and kill as clark quinn has said you know like sometimes you need drill and kill right you you yeah. just are you got to memorize these things but unless that's what you're having to do like it could be a fun party game for you know your team building event i guess uh <laughs> Jeopardy. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. We've all done it. We all have our Jeopardy board moments and we're not proud of them. Oh yeah. Or building information, right? It's like, I, I remember early, early in my career saying, this isn't our job as a training department where this is what they're asking for is just information. It, it shouldn't the communications team be building that or the, the marketing team or, or whatever. And you know, then the answer back was, well, no, you guys, have all the tech and you build this stuff for the training so why can't you build it why can't you make it for other things too right well it's because instructional design teams are marketing their change management their training all the skill sets right all the skill sets yeah. of the you know it, it's comms it's marketing it's the graphic design it's we have to put all that type of stuff together to make the things that we make it's just the secret sauce that we use that other people don't is that id part and though, yeah. but, but, and the people that we work for don't know that. And that's the hardest part, I think. Yeah. So you have do to you help, sell yourself. Yeah. Besides your book, do you, um, do you ever help people coach, coach the youngsters coming up that, uh, want to get into the business or they're looking to get into it or whatever? Do you ever have people just reach out and say, Hey, teach me something? Uh, sure. I mean, I do have a full-time job though. So my, <laughs> and I'm not coaching on the side right now, but, uh, yes. And we have a team of instructional designers too. Um, so I'm kind of always providing, uh, those tips and I see some, somebody has asked us for that in here. So, um, you know, what can you do? Well, connect up with the community. I mean, there, and, and I would read voraciously, um, I'm still buying new instructional design books, even though I don't do direct instructional design every day. I, I need to stay current. I want to know what's going on. I want to know what the people out there are thinking. So read. Um, uh, think about what your sweet spot is. Most of us came into this field for some reason. You know, Chris, you were a journalism major. Or that, that was your background. You're writing probably first and foremost. Brent, you, you had this flashy master's degree, but... Um, you had a I was a TV spot. guy. I was a broadcast journalist was my first career. Yeah. So you're yeah. a media guy. That was, yeah. you know, your sweet spot. And here you are doing a blog, a uh, blog, blog cast now, right? Like you're yeah. still, we, 20 years ago, we were circling around the blog fire and now we're circling around the video blog fire. Yeah, live streaming is, is the, is, what we do today with live streaming, it, I've always thought of it as it, it's exactly the same thing. It's just a different format it's the yep. exact same thing we were doing with blogs back in the day and then with yep. twitter and then with facebook and all of it, that it's evolved stuff. it's this it's similar conversations yeah so find your sweet spot um know what that is and hone it and then also take a look at what your gaps are and think about what are the things that you hate 
you know, like I talked about that learning pie, there's stuff in there that you're going to cringe at. Have that awareness. I mean, learn something about that area, though, too, because you're going to need to be somewhat versed, but you don't have to become an expert in it um, or all of them. And find people who will help round out your pie. There you go. Yeah. Hit cool. up that community. And speaking of communities, you can go to the Domino Idiotic community on LinkedIn as we roll out of here. Yeah, for sure. Folks, as we always have to mention, uh, what we get to do here in a Structural Designers in Offices, Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino. I threw a link into the chat there if you want to check out. Cammy, thanks Thank so you, much Cammie. for joining us. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks, and everyone, for joining today. It's really fun. Yeah, and there's always great stuff going on in the chat. Thanks so much, folks, and we'll see you next time. Great stuff, jokes, and everybody... I'm the store and buy Cammy's right. book, second edition. There it is, all right. Hope everybody has a great weekend and a great week.